All right. Thank you very much, everyone, for joining us this morning. My name is Patrick Svitek. I'm a political reporter for the Texas Tribune. Uh, thank you uh, for joining us both in person and online for this conversation with four new members of the Texas House. First of all, I want to thank today's sponsors, the presenting sponsors of our Texas 88th Legislature Series, our Texas State Technical College and Lone Star College. Major sponsors of this event are Raise Your Hand Texas, Methodist Healthcare Ministries of South Texas, Texas Association of School Business Officials, and Philanthropy Advocates. Though corporate sponsors and donors underwrite this event, they play no role in determining the content, speakers, or line of questioning. Before we begin, I want to take a moment to remind you that the Texas Tribune is a nonprofit news organization, which means we're supported by folks who value our journalism and public events like this and donate to us. Please consider donating to the Tribune to sustain our newsroom and support more events like this. Head to texastribune.org slash donate. And just some, some housekeeping notes here before we begin our conversation. We will have about 45 minutes of moderated question and answer, and then we'll have about 15 minutes for audience questions. Please. As a reminder, silence your cell phones. If you'd like to tweet from this event, please use the hashtag, hashtag TT events. And now I'd like to introduce our panelists. Uh, to my immediate left here, we have State Representative Carl Tepper, a Lubbock Republican. He's been a commercial real estate developer for over 20 years. In 2012, he was elected to chair the Lubbock County Republican Party and later as president of the Texas Republican County Chairman's Association. He's been actively involved in several presidential elections and, and was appointed as Texas statewide field director for the Trump-Pence 2016 presidential campaign. And to Representative Tepper's left is State Representative Mihaela Plisa, a Plano Democrat. She earned a bachelor's degree in political science from the University of North Texas and launched a career in public relations. She has worked with organizations like the Young National Organization of Women and the National Organization for the Reform of Marijuana Law. And then at the, to her left, making sure I'm getting this right, we have State Representative Lulu Flores, she served as president and CEO of the National Women's Political Caucus, the longest serving institution committed to increasing women's participation through the political process. She was elected as a national delegate for Hillary Clinton's presidential campaign, has chaired the Austin Arts Commission, and served as chief of staff to the first Mexican-American woman elected to the Texas House. Last but not least, at the opposite side of me, far opposite side of me, we have State Representative Ben Bumgarner, a Republican and a native of Flower Mound, he holds a Bachelor of Arts degree from Austin College in Sherman. He has served on the Flower Mound Town Council where he represented Place 3 and also served as Mayor Pro Tem. Bumgarner is the co-owner of a local business as well. All right, guys, let's uh, get started. And I want to talk about the legislative session which got underway last week. But first, I want to talk about uh, the election season we just got through. I know that uh, all four of you um, had very spirited races in each your own way, either in the primary or the general election, sometimes both. Um, so I want to start with Representative Plisa. Uh, I think I know you had a, a huge race, especially in, in the general election. You won a new seat in Collin County. I know Republicans really wanted to win that seat as well. They fought very hard for it. Um, in, the, in the general election, what did you learn about the mood of the electorate and how's that informing your approach to this, this session? Well, thank you so much for having me. And yeah, I'm honored to be the first Democrat to serve from Collin County in the state legislature in over 30 years. I'm the first female Democrat to ever represent Collin County in the state house. And we knocked on a lot of doors. I personally knocked on over 10,000 doors myself. My campaign knocked on over 50,000 doors. So we got a really good read on what people care about. And it's, you know, the kitchen table issues. It's our schools. It's health care. It's the safety of our teachers and students in the classrooms or anywhere, really. And so I think going into the legislature, we see we have, you know, $32 billion surplus. That's very rare. And there's a lot of things that, you know, need fixing. So a lot of our state agencies have cut back. And, you know, the electorate was very adamant that we start putting money back um, into our public schools, into safety, into health care. Thank you very much. And we will get to that surplus, <laughs> rest assured. Uh, Representatives uh, Tepper or Bumgarner, I know you both had very competitive primary runoffs. Um, and I know that you're now here to represent the whole district, but to tell me what your primary battles taught you about where you think this Republican Party is right now in Texas. I'll start, Ben. Um, right now, the more conservative, the better in Lubbock County. Uh, the voters are cynical. Uh, they don't know who to believe. 
the media or the politicians, and there's so much news, and it comes so fast, and it seems like nothing ever gets resolved. Um, in Lubbock, they want to be left alone. Um, they sort of have an attitude of, you know, I'm running my business, I'm, uh, I'm an employee, uh, I don't need one more thing in my life to get in my way of what I'm doing every day. And I think, uh, I think the COVID pandemic revealed a lot about uh, what government can do and mostly what it can't do and what it should stay out of. And um, that's the feedback I got. Representative Bumgarner, was it a similar situation in, in your Republican primary? Yeah, a little bit. Um, the mic on. So, but uh, for me, you know, five years ago, I wasn't even involved in politics. And I got involved because uh, local tax issues, transparency, and local government. And, you know, I banged a lot of doors, too. And uh, when, I, when I was knocking doors, for, for me, the, the top issues are just like what, what Rep. Plisa said. It's, it's, it's uh, tax reform. We, we need to get some, some help on, on that front, the, the border security. And, and people just want to be left alone. They just want to live the the best lives that they can, and, and they're worried about what's going on in the schools right now. And so, you know, there's some some other issues that my opponent ran on, and you know, I don't think that anybody uh, feels against it. And so, we want to fix those things too. But you know, you can't be a one trick pony when you're running. You have to be, you know, pretty well rounded, and you got to know a little bit about the issues. And I did, and that's how I won my race. Thank you, and, and Representative Flores, what are some of the main takeaways from your race that you're taking into this legislative session? Um, similar to the other folks here who have said people are hurting, uh, COVID had a big impact, but I, I think uh, my, my district is very diverse. I have some very high income districts and I also have um, people in the district and as well as probably the lowest uh, income folks in the, in the community live in my district. So it's very, very diverse, but I think overall people want to see our schools funded properly. They want to see their kids educated. They want to feel that teachers are being te treated with respect and should be paid for what, they, uh, what they're worth. And so I think it's time, especially now that we have this surplus that we'll be talking about, uh, to fix some real systemic issues that are, are, are hurting our state. And so uh, I, I think a lot of, we ha I have two school districts and in my district as well. So it, a lot of it ar around education, I knocked on a lot of doors as well myself. And hearing from retired teachers and even active teachers who are considering leaving, you know, they just need to feel that they are being respected and being paid for what they're worth. Same with state employee. Thank you very much. Um, as I mentioned, you all took your first votes last week. Uh, I think two big issues you had to take up were the, the speakership election and then the, the rules package. Um, and I'll start with Representative uh, Tepper and work my way down and then we'll try to alternate. But my question is, as new members, were either of those votes hard for you guys? There was obviously a nearly unanimous uh, speaker vote. The rules was a little more uh, contentious, but feel free to tackle either of those. Were those uh, tough votes for you all to take? Uh, no, they weren't. I mean, we had decided on the speaker easily and overwhelmingly during the caucus meeting. And then again, uh, on the House floor, there was a point of order about how the speaker would manage the House, whether uh, who would be chairman, who wouldn't. Uh, we elected the speaker to lead, and I think we're going to allow him to do that. So uh, that never came to a vote. Um, so uh, there were, as far as I'm concerned, there were no tough votes on, a, on the floor last week. And then we'll go to we'll go down this the line, and then I'll try to alternate so I don't keep putting Representative Tepper on the spot. So, re Representative, please. Yeah, no, I think that every every vote that we take um, on the floor needs to be well thought, and for me, they're all hard, even when they seem easy. Um, I was a little concerned with some of the amendments that I saw being put up on the rules. Um, you know, we go in every day and we say a prayer, we say the Pledge of Allegiance, and then we say the Texas Pledge. And we finish with one and indivisible. And it already seemed like the conversation that was being started was one that we were going to be a little bit divided, right? That there was scared of another quorum break, um, fines and expulsion was being talked about. Um, and so that, that was a little disconcerting. Um, and and a hard, hard vote, definitely, to take. The, the rules vote, to, to be yeah. specific. Well, um, yes, they're all serious votes. And obviously, being the first vote, voting on the speaker's race was pretty much a given, uh, uh, given that we didn't have any Democrats being nominated. And that especially- Not a tenderhold supporter. Not technically. <laughs> and so we were 
I'm 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 really hopeful for the speaker. He speaks uh, in a moderate in a moderated tone, and I'm hoping that he want, he's going to try to um, unite us. As, as, and I was as well on the House rules vote. Uh, obviously, voted for some of the amendments that were to help protect, you know, our voting rights, et cetera, that were brought up by the Mexican-American Legislative Caucus and others. And I was disconcerted with the fact that not only were the speeches nominating uh, the, the opposing uh, speaker candidate uh, somewhat very divisive, in my opinion, and I didn't like the, the tenor that, that that was setting right off the bat. I, I you know, I know that this is, can be and it w probably will be contentious because there are some, some issues that we are not going to see eye to eye on and we're going to stand toe to toe on those issues. However, on most of the issues that I think we need to work on for the people of the state of Texas, uh, call for us to be work together and I'm hoping to build relationships with folks across the aisle so that we can do that for our, for our state. So um, didn't quite like the tone we got started off on by some of those amendments, especially those amendments, uh, and also the nominating speeches uh, for opposing speaker. Got it, Representative Bumgarner. How did you process those two big votes last week? So they're 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 pretty easy for me as well. But you know, you always take in consideration your district, what's going to be best for, for for the people of your district, and you know, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, for me, I, I, I built a relationship with, with, with Speaker Feeling early. He was he helped me out tremendously throughout my race, and and you know I got to know him as a person. And you know I when when you sit down and you and you vet a candidate that's running for office, I did the same with him. I was like I was like is is he going to align with the way that I perceive things? And he really does. And and there's a lot of things that go on in the press and social media and things like that. And I, I think if you would actually sit down and talk with the man, you would get to know him a little more, and you would see that he's not the way that he's perceived in the press or those things. And I stand by him. I stand by my vote for, for Speaker Phelan. And, you know, we, the, the rules are set. We're moving forward, and we're getting a lot done for Austin and for Texas the, in my district. We're going to do great things this session. So. Got it. Thank you very much. So let's definitely talk about that surplus. A few of you have already mentioned that's one of the big topics heading into this session. Um, I'll start with you, Representative Plisa. Um, I, wanted, I want to know what you, how you think that surplus should be spent uh, but we've heard so many of the same topics. So tell me how you think it should be spent, and then is there some topic you think isn't getting enough attention based on what you're hearing from your district or maybe conversations you've had since getting to Austin? Uh, public education. Um, our teachers are suffering. Our kids are suffering. School districts like mine are suffering. Um, I have one of the largest recapture districts in the state of Texas. We sent back um, over $250 million. It goes into general revenue. So I'd like to see that recapture money stay in public education. I would love to see not just our current teachers get a pay increase, our retired teachers get a cost of living adjustment. Um, they need more than just a 13th check. They need a 14th, 15th check. Um, so public education, I think, is the number one thing. Also public health. Um, we definitely need to get resources to women and children quickly um, so that they can live, you know, the lives that our Constitution promises them. Um, so I would say public health and public education would be the top two places I would like to see the, the money go. Thank you very much. Representative Flores, we'll go to you next. Of course, public education. I would, um, there's been bills that are being filed to that I intend to sign on to, to raise the basic allotment, to change the way it's funded by uh, basing it on enrollment versus attendance. We need to put more state money into our public school system. That will help with the recapture. Austin, Texas has a huge recapture issue. And, uh, and obviously, by increasing our state share and, and really addressing it, that will address uh, teacher raises. It will address uh, property taxes because it'll lower the, the individual county's share and school district share, and so I, I look forward to seeing that. We need more money into health. I would love to see us expand Medicaid. I would also love to see us put in money into our mental health uh, because we have had a crisis that COVID exacerbated. Children are suffering from mental health issues as well. We really need to fund that system, as well as you know, Child Protective Services is a system that's broken that needs to be Address that we have to make sure that 
we can take care of those kids who need our help and 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 making sure that we do some things systemically that are is going to that are going to address those issues. Thank you very much, and Representative Bumgarner, what are your your priorities for that surplus? Any issues flying under the radar? So, <clears throat> ser serving a, a, a in, a, in a local municipality, I got to see some of the little heartburn issues that that you, that normal people don't get to see behind the radar. So, like. Uh, one of the things the, the 87th pass, our judges, they had to have a little green light system whenever they were intaking people in the jail, but none of the systems in the jails talked to each other. I learned this out, and it was kind of a headache when you're moving things back and forth uh, and, and trying trying to, you know, make sure that people were safe. And so I'd like to see some money go there, but the I guess where we're going to, you know, have the biggest fight is that's our money. The reason why we have surplus, we pay too much in taxes. So I want to see it go back to we the people because that's our money. The the biggest outcry that I had when I was banging doors is we're paying too much, and I think we all we all hit the nail on the head when it when it's on the education side with recapture and things like that. Louisville Independent School District is is my largest employer in a uh, sixty three, and I think we gave up around forty million dollars in recapture last year, and this year it's going to be closer to seventy million dollars when it's all said and done. And so I like to see that money stay in stay in my district to to, to fund our teachers, give them raises make sure that we get the proper tax cuts to our people because if we can really reform and figure out how we're gonna pay for education going forward, we can save the, the, the homeowners of Texas a lot of money. So that's what I'm, I'm all about. Got it, and we will, uh, next question, I'll ask for a little more specifics on, on property tax proposals, but Representative Tepper, broadly speaking, what are your priorities for spending yeah, the surplus? Yeah, just to be clear, that $30 billion isn't gonna get to be used. The Texas Constitution is gonna limit that to about, it limits its, its own growth. So I think it's going to limit it to about $12 billion, which suddenly doesn't sound like a lot, does it? It does it, but it's still a lot of money. Uh, the, uh, property, yeah, the property uh, owners are looking to get some of their money back. They were overcharged, they feel. Uh, so that's one thing we're going to be looking at is getting some of their money returned to them. Uh, the other issue we brought up um, talking about uh, the surplus is infrastructure. Uh, there are a lot of things, including public schools, bridges, you name it, dams uh, that have needed maintenance around the state. Um, it's interesting. I've talked to all of my superintendents, a lot of teachers. Um, raises weren't the big thing with them. Uh, it was uh, not that anyone wouldn't like a raise, Patrick, but uh, I think the things they're looking at is um, the more burden that they're having in schools, uh, the discipline problems they're having in schools. Uh, Senator Perry has a comprehensive plan about school discipline and how it's become tougher to run the schools. And um, we're also looking at um, the, the public university system uh, is looking for different means to uh, fund itself. So you have some emerging flagship universities. One of, one of them is my own Texas Tech. And so whether some of that surplus will be used to go towards those projects, you know, will, is there to be seen. But I promise you, every district has spent the $12 billion themselves, each over and five times over on things that the state needs. So uh, before everyone thinks that we're just overflowing with dollars, and we are a little bit, we've been blessed, and it's a Texas miracle, we hope to keep it that way, that there is a limited amount of money that's gonna be spent on everyone's, uh, everyone's projects. Got it, and like I said, I want to drill down a little bit on, on property taxes, and I think Representative Flores, it's uh, your turn to, to take the question first. <laughs> what are some of the specific ideas that you've heard that you like on property tax relief? What do you think the direction of that conversation should be? Well, I mentioned, oops, sorry. I mentioned the first one is by Ra raising the, the basic allotment that would help lower the tax burden on, on uh, property, dis property districts. But, um, you know, I think that's uh, a good way to approach it. I don't think just giving money back to the people, I, I, I understand and I agree that people do feel that they are paying a lot in property taxes and need some relief. However, that can occur by putting the money and investing it into the school and, and seeing that reduction happen that way. As far as other specifics, I don't really have one at this point. But, uh, it is early. <laughs> it is early. Uh, but uh, I do know that we want to make sure that businesses pay, pay their fair share, uh, that, yes, individuals should uh, get some relief, but that businesses should also make sure that they still are paying their fair share and, and not just... Uh, you know, let them off the hook necessarily. 
Representative Tepper, you have something you want to share? Yeah, I, uh, I've i been tracking this property tax issue for a long time. I even have a letter to George W. Bush about it when uh, when he was governor and I was a junior property manager. <laughs> uh, we have, you know, I was living here in Austin, as a matter of fact. We had properties that were being reappraised 53% in one year and over. Um, I had spurted discussions with people uh, from a few sessions ago about their property tax um, relief. Um, you know, Representative Burroughs was chairs of ways and means that we would argue about whether uh, he wanted to limit and did the uh, income that the school districts, the uh, counties and cities could take in and approach it from that angle. I always wanted to approach it from the appraisal angle. Um, so I think they actually did, people are gonna get upset. I think they actually did an okay job uh, when they limited the income that these taxing districts can bring in. But I think there's more we can do to stabilize the system. I think that's what business and I think homeowners are looking for. So I've introduced a bill to uh, lower um, the cap, you know, the cap, you could sell your house for whatever, okay, these are just caps on what your, what your homes are going to be calculated on for their annual uh, property taxes. Right now it's 10%. Uh, in Austin, you probably see that every year. You probably hit that 10% cap level every year. In Lubbock, we never used to see it. It would be uh, maybe 5%. Now we're starting to see that 10% every year, even in places like Lubbock, Texas. So I've, I filed a bill for that your homestead, uh, your homestead, your homestead exemption would be uh, limited to 2.5% every year that you can be calculated on. I'd like to introduce uh, a cap on rental uh, investment and commercial property to 8%. So it'll further uh, stabilize the system and help people um, better forecast what their property taxes are going to be every year. Got it. Thank you very much. Representative uh, Bumgarner, uh, when you hear property tax relief, what are some ideas that come to mind or things you've heard that you like? <clears throat> so for me, when I was on... Uh, Town Council in Flower Mound. That was my. That was one of my biggest things. <clears throat> budget time. August through September, I'm going through line by line. What can I cut out of the budget to make it work? Well, you know, the state of Texas has a little bit bigger budget, and I'm not going to have the time to do that. But, you know, when you're talking, when we're talking about taxes, what's the biggest chunk of your tax that you pay that's always going up? And it's you know the school the school side, and you know that's a testament to how big you know the state's growing and and, and things like that. And you know our. our our, our children are our biggest investment, so I'm, no one's going to argue that. But there can be a better way that we can actually help save our our our, our homeowners. And M and O on on the education side, let's get rid of that off the take that burden off of homeowners, and let's give it back to the state and let the state figure out how they're going to pay for it and redistribute it across the masses. Because there's enough people in the state that everybody should be paying their fair share. And you're going to be hearing a lot of things about you know how other things are be paying how how things are going to be paid for and and how money's be moved around but if we don't if we don't address that 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 issue we're just going to be kicking the can down the road and it's going to make a lot of people suffer and we got to we got to you know at least change the formula up a little bit now to just tweak it here and there to see how if we can fix it got it and i think representative police it's your turn yeah, no, I mean, I look forward to having conversations with all my classmates on this issue. Um, I really talked about, you know, raising the basic allotment, maybe adding a mental health allotment in our school f um, funding formulas. That's going to be the most, the quickest and most in instantaneous way for us to immediately feel that property tax relief. But I also want to build on unique ways um, of getting people that are kind of falling through the cracks, their property tax exemptions. Last session, as a legislative staffer, I worked on Prop 8, the constitutional amendment, to give our Gold Star families um, their property tax exemption. And this session, I filed a bill to make sure that our Border and Custom Patrol agents get that property tax exemptions if something were to happen to them. And so, um, though I look forward to working with everybody on the issue, I, I also feel like we can find people that are falling through the cracks. Got it. Well, thank you very much for your answers. Uh, I wanted to shift focus to education, which I know some of you have already brought up, particularly teacher pay raises. We've seen a lot of discussion of that. Uh, so I want to know what your general priorities are for education this session. Um, and I'll add this on because I'm sure we're, we're going to hear from it, uh, from the governor later to his inaugural address is this concept of uh, parental rights. And I know that that's a kind of umbrella term he used in his campaign to talk about uh, you know, issues of curriculum, what students are being taught in the classroom, or issues of school choice, providing different options for, uh, you know, sending kids to schools outside the traditional public school system. Uh, so with, with that in mind, when you think about education this session, what are your priorities? Um, and I think Representative Bum, uh, Bumgarner, it's your turn to go first. Yay. So on education, I mean, I, I think I'm the only one 
in my class that has this viewpoint, but, you know, get politics out of schools. Let's get back to teaching our kids the, the, the basics. My daughter, she's 14 years old, and she has a whole period dedicated to how she's feeling every day. I mean, I mean, we, we can sit there and we can, we can talk about how kids feel, but, I mean, kids are going, you know, 14-year-olds are going through puberty. They're going to feel one way one, one day, and they're going to feel a totally different way the next day or maybe even 20 minutes. It's like Texas weather. Stick around. You know, if you don't like it, you're going to get something better in a, in a few minutes or much worse. But, you know, I, I really want to see our teachers focus on, on, on the things that matter. Let's not teach to a test. Let's give them – the, the reason why our teachers went to school and, and did the things that they did was was to become a creative mind and so that you, our, our kids aren't stuck in a box because when we get into the real world, we're not in a box anymore. We're, we're, we're having to, you know, fix real world problems and let's get them ready for that. Let's let's get Texas up on the leading edge of those things and let's let's solve some of the some of the issues that are going to lead forward to us in, in, in the real world scenarios. And I want to see that. Thank you. Representative Tepper, we'll go to you next. Uh, I appreciate some of the other representatives talking about mental health. Uh, one of the things that did reverberate uh, in some of the discussions I had with uh, superintendents and teachers is that uh, the continual discipline problems that are uh, manifesting themselves in the schools making it difficult for children to learn. So I'm, I'm, I'm curious about every idea that we might have for uh, the counselors need to become counselors again, that sort of thing. Uh, and by the way, once those children graduate when they're 18 or so, then they end up uh, homeless on the streets here. So I think the uh, issues are related in that we're losing our major metropolitan uh, areas to uh, homeless camps, homeless problems, uh, severe mental illness problems, uh, substance abuse problems, and it's starting in the schools and we can identify it, but it seems like we can't do a lot about it. That's one of the things I think I wanna see. The other is, uh, you know, how quickly time flies. Uh, we had Uvalde uh, just a few months ago in May. As a matter of fact, that was our runoff election day um, and it was a horrible thing. So in education, we're gonna be looking at uh, more, I mean, we have some older schools. So the newer schools are built, you know, pretty safe. Nothing can, you know, repel everything. But uh, the newer schools are definitely safer and better designed. Uh, we're going to be looking at some funding to uh, harden the schools or make them safer so that um, it would be much more highly unlikely that uh, a mass shooter can come through. And uh, the first thing we need to do to educate our children is keep them alive. So I think we need to defend our schools better. Got it. Representative Plisa? Yeah, uh, recapture. Recapture is going to be the number one issue for my district. We're seeing our property taxes going up and up and up. And our school districts are in trouble. Our, we're losing teachers. We're losing band teachers. We're losing coaches um, because they can move not that far away and have a cheaper house, um, better property values, things like that. So that's going to be my number one issue. Mental health is going to be really, really big. We want to make sure that our teachers and our kids feel safe in the classroom. Um, but also how that money is being um, allocated to the school districts. We want to make sure that like school districts like mine have control over how that money is being spent. We've done really, really great things to make sure that our schools are hardened, to make sure that we've um, kind of stayed ahead of the game on these kinds of things. And so I want to make sure that they have control on how they can spend their money. Um, but definitely recapture is going to be number one for me. Thank you very much. Representative Flores. Well, uh, in listening to what teachers have to say, I think it's super important to make sure that they get the respect that they deserve. And I agree that we don't, uh, you know, I'm glad you say don't teach to the test because that has been a huge issue and I know that we need to do uh, better by our kids. And uh, while you're saying that you don't need to have a whole period for seeing how you kids feel, but I believe that social emotional learning is very important because I think dealing with mental health issues, kids need to be in touch with how they feel, how to deal with their emotions. And I think that's a whole uh, part of learning as well is learning to make sure that you're able to, uh, you know, work with others and learn with others and and play with others and so i think that's all part of a curriculum that's super important and that will help kids be healthy uh in a, in a holistic way so looking for funding for more counselors in the schools to make sure that if there are issues especially issues as huge as the uvalde uh shooting that was mentioned there are lots of ramifications to that and then also really recovering from the impact of COVID, it had a lot of effect that, that needs to be addressed. And so uh, I believe funding for 
you know, better training for teachers, allowing them and trusting them to do their jobs and, and making sure they're getting paid for what they're worth so they aren't leaving the profession and treat it as a profession for once. Thank you. And just to follow up, um, I wanted to ask one of the, maybe one of the Republicans on the panel on this broad concept of school choice. Do you, do you see a lot of traction uh, in, the, in the House this session? That's usually one of those issues um, where you see an urban-rural divide. Yeah, we definitely see some, some traction in this. I'm for it. Um, parents are demanding some options, especially after COVID. Um, it revealed a lot of uh, breaks in our system and our school districts and a lot of disagreements. So parents would like the option to go a different direction. Um, my daughter goes to a public school. We're really happy with the services. So uh, I think the public schools, uh, it's been a dirty word to say choice or any of those sort of sort, sorts of words. Um, I just don't see a major fleeing from the public schools if people have a choice and an option to go someplace else. Uh, I don't see it in the rural communities. I don't see it in the urban communities. I think the, uh, I think the public schools need to have some uh, self-confidence, some pride in the, in the job they're doing, but some families just want to go a different direction. I think we need to give them that option. Got it. When you say you're, you're for it, you're talking about that that general concept of school choice. I know we'll probably the concept see a of, of, of bills. some sort of yeah. a plan, and 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 it probably won't be dollar to dollar on you know whatever the the state pays a public school per child. It'll probably be half or something of that sort, and then the public school might keep the rest of the uh, the money. I've seen some different plans bandied around, and um, I'd like to see all of them. Um, but I'm telling you right now, the, uh, the parents of, um, of, of uh, Texas public school children or children in general uh, would like to see some options out there. By the way, our university system works the same way. If you know, I had my GI Bill, I could use it at Texas Tech, I could use it at Baylor, I could use it at uh, SMU, and we have the greatest university system in the world. You can come here, people, students come here from all over the world to utilize our university system no matter what their funding is, whether it's from their government or from their parents or from their job or from a Pell Grant or GI Bill. So um, I think that we have the greatest university system in the world because they have, we, give, we give people choices. So I think uh, that we'd have the same outcome if we did that in a public school system. Got it, thank you. Anyone else wanna weigh in on that before we move on to the next topic? I think we need to keep public dollars into our public schools. We should not be taking dollars. That we need to be improving our public schools and addressing the issues that concern our teachers and our kids and the system and not take dollars away from that uh, and give to private enterprise. Okay, go quick. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just gonna say it's only school choice if you get chosen. And a lot of times, um, you know, there's not parity there. So I'd like to see some parity between public schools and charters Got or it. vouchers. Thank you very much. Oh, I'm going to wait in two Go hours. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I never liked the idea of um, education becoming big business, but unfortunately that's the way it's become. And, uh, you know, I'm a free market guy, and uh, that's one thing that we have to do to keep, keep public schools in check is maybe we should give some money to charter schools and, and, and see if it balances out. Because in my district, I, I, I have – private schools I have charter schools I have a lot of people that homeschool and you know the co-ops are you know they, they've done amazingly and you know I, I read a study not too long ago over the summer saying that uh, universities actually prefer homeschoolers over over uh, public schoolers uh, when it comes to uh, general mission because they have a more well-rounded uh, education coming in and so I, I if, if it's going to solve our issues and, and get our kids learning then I'm all for it so let, let's try something Got it. Thank you very much, everyone, for your answers on that uh, follow-up question. Uh, one more big, broad topic I wanted to talk about before we get to audience questions is, is the border, which is an issue we're likely to hear from Governor Abbott later today. Uh, we've seen a little more uh, bipartisan focus on this recently with uh, President Biden visiting El Paso. I know over the weekend, New York City uh, Mayor Eric Adams visited El Paso. Um, what is your review generally of the current border security effort. This will be the first you know, full legislative session since we saw the governor take all this executive action. Do you want to rein it in? Do you want to expand it? What's your overall uh, view of what Texas is doing right and, and maybe wrong on the border, if you have a, an opinion on that? And I think I lost a little track. I think Representative Tepper, we're back to starting with you. Sure, uh, I salute Governor Abbott for doing for using every tool imaginable in his toolbox to secure that border, whether it be building our own wall, contra Tina wire, um, maybe looking at magnets, what have you. Uh, I, it's a federal issue. Um, it seems like everything we do um, is being negated by federal policy um, and allowing people into the border. 
Um, I will tell you, it's, uh, I'm glad the mayor of New York City was down in El Paso this weekend um, because I think Governor Abbott was brilliant to get volunteers to ride on those buses to go to these different cities and show America this is a national issue, not just a Texas, Arizona, and New Mexico issue. And uh, it looks like President Biden um, needs to get on the job and needs to get to work and needs to adopt some plans that were previously in place by previous presidents to help secure the border. Um, it was an international relations type of uh, scenario where you had remain in Mexico policy and it was working. So I'm not sure what happened with that. What's happening now is absolutely inhumane. Uh, it's inhumane to have people and criminals and everyone, and not everyone is criminals who's coming over the border, but a lot of these countries are sending us criminals from, uh, from their countries to here, kind of like the Mariana boat lift from Cuba, uh, where we're not getting doctors and lawyers from Mexico and Guatemala and everywhere else. Uh, we're getting some laborers, which would be great, and I wish we had a better immigra immigration plan to deal with it. But I'm telling you now, we need to handle this issue. It's, it's, it's affecting everything in Texas that we have, whether it be our hospitals, uh, our education system, and, and all of our infrastructure. And um, I pray for Governor Abbott every day. Uh, I hope he keeps coming up with ways to show that this is a national issue, that the federal government needs to take the reins of this. But um, it's been a tough one. I'm looking forward to some uh, further briefings on it. Representative Polisa, what's your uh, overall review of what Texas is doing at the border? Yeah, well, I definitely agree with Representative Tepper that it is inhumane. Um, you know, our National Guard has now been deployed on Operation Lone Star for two, three years. Um, we are seeing benefits parity issues there because they've been deployed by the governor, not the federal government. I have signed on to Representative Patterson's bill on this parity issue and look forward to bringing real results um, to, to the border, not just talking about it, not just making it a political issue. Um, Texas had been on the forefront of guest worker programs, right? The Bracero program was one of these programs in the 50s, 60s, and we need to be the leader on this issue again. Um, it's not going to go away. Um, spending billions and billions of do dollars on a border wall has not fixed it. Um, you know, I'm not against border security, but I think the thing looks more like an art installation than border security, right? So we need to do a better job, and I'm willing to work with my colleagues to, to make the border safe, but also as a first-generation daughter of immigrants, that we have a succinct and um, working immigration um, policy and asylum process. Got it. Representative Flores? I agree. It's a federal issue that the Congress needs to address. It's not just the president that needs to address this issue. Congress needs to act. They're the legislative body. So we need uh, to make sure that we have a comprehensive immigration reform at the federal level. I don't agree with having all this uh, deployment of folks at the border. I, I believe that was more political grandstanding than it was anything that was effective. Uh, I do. I grew up on the border. And I remember a time when the border, I mean, we were communities divided by a bridge, not by, you know, it wasn't hostile. We grew up together. Uh, we had uh, commerce and flow, free flow of, of communities going back and forth. So I do believe we need to have compassion. I agree that it's inhumane to treat people the way they are, but I don't agree that we should be treating them like pawns and shipping them around the country and basically trafficking them to other states. Uh, we have to understand that people that are coming here are looking for a better way of life for themselves or their children or are fleeing from persecution or violence in their own countries. That does need to be addressed, and our federal government does need to do something with those governments to make sure that those issues are addressed at home. I don't want to see criminals exported to our country. Uh, I agree with that. But we also need to make sure that what we're doing is compassionate. And I agree with what you said about the border wall. I, I don't think that's where, I mean, there are ways to do security through technology and other ways that, and policy that we can take care of it better than building a wall that really desecrates a lot of environmental areas and, and builds barriers with communities in other countries. Thank you very much, Representative Bumgarner. I think everybody hit it, hit the nail on the head with this one, but the one thing that I, I want people to talk more and to recognize and, and, and bring this out, we're talking, we're not just talking about criminals, we're talking about victims. There's gonna be $20 billion what the cartels are gonna make over on human trafficking, and that's not even including the, the drug trafficking that's coming into through, through Texas. I mean, once you get on 35 and you get through, 
it's a free shot to the rest of the country. And, and that's what the governor, through the busing all around, is trying to get them to recognize. We're trying to get this into a national event because <clears throat> I have friends that live up north. Until the buses started to flow in up, up, up into that area, they didn't even know there was an issue on, on the southern border. They had no idea because the national media isn't talking about it. Nobody's talking about it, but now everybody's talking about it. Because why? Because of what Governor Abbott, Abbott has done. And so kudos to him to, to bringing this to the forefront, to making sure that we're going to get the help that we need from the federal government. And it, it sounds like uh, the president finally has has said that he's going to make this you know an issue going forward for, for the rest of the of the year. So I hope that's the case. And I really hope that we can do something about it because nobody wants to see the trafficking. In my district alone, I mean, we, we have an issue with, with massage parlors. We have an issue with with, with, with the underground brothels. And it, it, it's happening in your back. If it can happen in Flower Mound, Texas, it can happen anywhere in, in the state. And so that's the one thing that we just need to be cognizant of is that it's not, we're not just talking about criminal enterprises here. We're talking about victims. We need to do something for them. God, I think Representative Tepper yeah, I think I think I I think I speak for everyone. We're pleading with Congress. We're absolutely pleading with you to please get your act in yep. order. The President, the Congress, the Senate, the House of Representatives to please find a solution for this. Get that border secure, and then find a solution for uh, basic immigration. We've all had friends who have had family members from other countries. They were legitimately married, and it takes years to get their citizenship or their uh, permanent status in the United States. Um, it's an old system. It's a dirty system. It needs to be fixed. It needs to be cleaned up. And we're pleading with you. That was time you have a Republican House. You have a Democratic uh, Senate pretty much split. And you have a Democratic president. And this is what a great uh, issue this is for bipartisanship and work together and get this border secured and get this immigration uh, crisis settled. Thank you very much. And uh, if you'd like to ask a, a question, you can start lining up at the mic we have over here on uh, this side of the room. Uh, one other uh, topic I had on here before we get to audience questions um, relates to uh, a big issue we saw in the campaign was the overturning of Roe v. Wade. There was lim very limited discussion in some races about uh, you know, adding exceptions to the state's abortion ban going into this uh, session. If you hear the Republican leadership, that seems pretty unlikely. What we have heard from Speaker Phelan is that he wants to try again to extend postpartum uh, Medicaid coverage for new mothers to, to 12 months. This was something the House tried last time. Uh, the Senate cut it in half, I believe. On that issue, just he, it was top of mind because he mentioned it in his, his opening day speech. Is there, is there broad support in the House for doing that again or, or taking that up again? You know, it's one of those things, how are you gonna vote against mothers, you know? So I can't imagine that there's a lot of, um, a lot of pushback against that, but we'll have to look at the bill and see what the numbers look like. Yeah, any, anybody have strong thoughts on that when they heard Speaker Phelan mention that? I definitely think that and there is a strong bipartisan support. Unfortunately, we keep seeing Texas leading on maternal mortality. Uh, we saw the state didn't release the numbers right away. That's very concerning. Um, and we were already leading the country in these numbers. Now we're doubling them, or it's like 36% on top of where we already were. So... Um, Expanding postpartum care is just a very small um, thing that we need to do. I mean, there's so much. If we do not bring exemptions for rape and incest in this state, we are headed down a very dark path. So I hope that my colleagues on the other side of the aisle take a real serious mm -hmm. look at this issue. Got it. And Representative Flores, Representative Bumgarner, do you want to add anything I to absolutely topic? agree with what was just said. Uh, we also, uh, at the minimum, the 12 months, and... And we could, by expanding Medicaid, also bring in more dollars that would cover women a lot sooner, even in the prenatal uh, periods of their life, which is super important for having healthy pregnancies. We need cultural sensitivity among doctors when treating patients from other cultures to make sure that they're understanding what's going on. And at, at, at a very minimum, we need to include the exceptions for in incest and rape because that's, I mean... That's that's huge beyond uh, comprehension that that would not be uh, even considered. And we have to deal with the issue of clarity for the medical profession in terms of the life of the mother. That is such an important thing. And we are seeing doctors that are uh, have been paralyzed because of the fear of prosecution or, you know, fear of, of what, how vague the statute is. So we need some clarity on that as well so that our medical profession can act without fear of retribution. 
Thank you very and much. Save, my, save yeah. women's lives. And represent Bumgarner. Any thoughts on that topic? Yeah, I'm all I'm all for with uh, this postpartum uh, 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 amendment that we're going to bring forward because you know we're, we're saving thousands of babies' lives a year, and 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 now we need to make sure that we're taking care of mamas, like like Rep Tepper said. And I'm all for that. So that's let's do it. Thank you very much. Let's get to some audience questions. Uh, as a reminder, as always, try to keep your questions uh, short and sweet so we can get to all our panelists and include as many questions as possible. Go ahead. Good morning, and thank you. Um, this question's for Rep Flores. I'm also wondering uh, Rep Tepper's thoughts. We're talking about the surplus. We're talking about um, public ed, public safety uh, at schools. Uh, here in Austin, AISD just voted for an over $1 billion bond. A lot of that money is going to go to improvements at schools for school safety. So, and that, of course, the bond speaks directly to property taxes, um, which are tough in Austin. So my question is, do you think it's reasonable to approach the state legislature uh, with this surplus and ask for money for those municipalities who have issued bonds recently for school safety improvements? Uh, is a reimbursement because they wanted to get out ahead and address this issue immediately. Well, if there's an opportunity to do so, because I think it's really important to make sure that our schools are safe and that our kids are safe. And, uh, you know, we need to make sure that those dollars are there. So if there is an opportunity, I'm happy to look at it. I'm not as advised at this time as to how that could work if it could work, but I'm, I'm certainly open to discussions, but I do believe that we do need to have uh, more dollars, state dollars put into making sure that our schools are safe. Representative Tepper too, I think, right? Please. It was $2.4 billion in bonds, wasn't it? Maybe all together, yeah. So, so what's the question? A portion of that was for school safety to improve the capital improvements of public schools to make them safer. Um, if municipalities are trying to get ahead, is that something the state could reimburse for so it's not passed on as a property tax? Yeah, you tax? know, thanks, thanks for the yes. Okay, thank you for that. I actually had that discussion with some superintendents about who have already done the right things. I mean, all their doors lock. Um, they have, um, in Lubbock, we had a big bond election too. It's been a few years. They've already... Uh, harden the um, you know the entry to the school where you have to push the button like a New York City apartment and then uh, the office is locked as well and has the emergency buttons to lock it down so uh, should they be reimbursed for being foresighted into doing those security measures uh, that the state's probably going to mandate now and what have you I don't know uh, we're gonna have to look at it and I, that's probably going to go through I suspect the appropriations process it seems to me since my school districts did the work they should get reimbursed, right? But if somebody didn't do their work yet, uh, are they going to wait to get reimbursed? And should you know the state save the money and just give it to the school districts who haven't done it yet? Uh, it sounds like a petty, maybe debate, um, you know, because we want to save the kids one way or the other. Uh, we we want to make them safe, but um, I think it's going to be a spirited discussion to see if uh, the school districts who have already done those improvements should get reimbursed for it. I just want to say, I, I know what you're talking about because Plano ISD has been doing the same thing. And that's why it's really important when we look at the money that we're getting, that the school districts have control over that money. That the school districts, if you're gonna give a school district money for safety, right? We're not saying uh, this money is gonna go to bulletproof bookshelves, right? That this money goes for school safety. But we're not mandating that that safety be double locks, retina scans, blood tests, whatever, right? We need to make sure that the school districts have control over the money that we're giving them. And that's, I think, what... Well, no. I don't know. That's been an issue in the past. We, <laughs> we, we need to have some accountability. We, I don't know. Sure, I agree with you. We have, I think we need to have some accountability, and there's going to be some uh, spectrum of uh, items that can be purchased with the money. All right, we'll move on to the... Thank you. Thank you very much. We'll move on to the next question here. <laughs> if it makes you feel better, I have that same trouble oh, sometimes. Oh, thank okay. Uh, first of all, I really want to thank you all for being here this early in the morning. I know you have a, a, a busy schedule. And I, I guess my question is for the two gentlemen. Um, when In your opening remarks, you both of you mentioned that your constituents want to be left alone. What does that mean? I'm trying to understand that. I mean, I grew up in Elgin, Texas, <laughs> and uh, so well, let me anyway. let me help you. Okay. Uh, they're they're running their businesses. 
Um, they've got enough taxes, enough regulation, enough oversight. Um, I'm a commercial property manager. I managed this building at one point in my career, as a matter of fact. And um, when you have interference from government, it just ruins your day often. Uh, you might have one fire marshals, for example. They'll come in and they'll tell you, uh, and by the way, brand new buildings at times, you know, you have fire sprinklers here. The next guy will come and say, you need them over here. No, you need them over here. You need to move them around. They're not correct. Um, and that's just one example. Talk to any restaurant operator uh, in the state, and they'll tell you they want to be left alone. Now, they're happy with basic health and safety uh, measures, but when the government comes in and tells you how to, ru how to run your business, where do they, in, in COVID, they were telling you whether you could even open your doors or not, that's the type of thing they're talking about. They want to be left alone, fix the potholes, make sure the lights come on when you flip the switch. But after that, they want to run their own business without a lot of interference. Okay, so you're, Agreed. So, so you're saying you're just uh, against regulations? Uh, regulations, high taxes. I'm a pretty basic Republican. Regulations, high taxes. I'm a social, I'm a social conservative as well. You want to say anything more about that, Representative Bumgarner? Yeah, the smaller, the smaller the government, the better, in my opinion. I'm, I'm one of those Republicans as well. But uh, one of my, uh, literally, one of my uh, municipalities in my district is a bedroom community. They were built around a uh, golf course, and they, the only thing they care about is what time they're going to wake up in the morning and if they can get a tee time to go play, you know, 18. And that's what they want. They, they don't, they don't want to be hassled. They don't want to have to have to deal with some of the issues that were that. We're facing and and they just want to be they want common sense to take over again and just and just lead the way on those things and that's why they they elected us to make sure that we are making sure that co common sense and sensibility is is taken in austin here so well i hope that same sensibility and common sense and that a right to privacy would extend to women as well and doctors because less government would be not having your government intruding in a doctor's office, when a woman and her and her husband and uh, or a, a couple are, are are making decisions about their family or their, you know, reproductive issues, uh, having the government interfere in that, I think, is highly intrusive. And I worked for a regulatory agency called the Railroad Commission of Texas, and we regulate the oil and gas industry. You need environmental regulation. You need public health and safety regulation uh, because we have to make sure that our you know, people and our environment are protected. So to me, those are very important things. And I agree that you don't need to encroach, but at the same time, we do need public safety and public health taken care of. Okay, let's And move just on. for we clarification, neither one of us said briefly. that we were against any of those things. Right, we were just clearly saying that, you know, the smaller the government, the better. Let people live their best lives. I'm glad we all agree. Thank you very much, everyone. We got uh, two more questions. I want to make sure we got time to get to them. And on that happy note, uh, <laughs> let me first say congratulations to all of you on your election. People of Texas are very glad to have you representing them or they wouldn't have voted for you. So we're glad you're there. Um, I appreciate very much that almost every each of you have said that public education and retired teacher issues are important to you. Uh, I'd like to have just throw a question out and to whomever would like to answer it. Uh, the retired teachers of the state of Texas have not received a COLA, an increase in their retirement for over 20 years. I'd like to get your uh, idea of the climate within the legislature for one passing this session. Who wants to take that? Prospects for a COLA? I don't, I don't know what the climate is. I haven't talked to a lot of people about this. I know I've heard from my constituency and my retired teachers about a raise. Uh, look, it, I think it's important for the retired teachers to be clear and, uh, might I say, honest about it seems that the, the teachers who have been retired longer kind of got the shaft. Uh, it seems like the teachers who retired in the 80s, maybe the 70s, have a lot lower retirement rate uh, than the teachers who are retiring now. So, uh, and I haven't taken a deep dive into it, to be honest with you, but I've had some uh, pretty long discussions with some senior legislators about it and some retiring legislators about it. And it seems that if there's going to be uh, an increase, great, um, then it would probably need to be an increase towards the, the teachers who are retired a longer time out 
than the teachers who are retiring in, in more, the more recent years. I don't know if you agree with that or not. I'd be curious to get your opinion on it. It sounds like you're very interested in this issue. But uh, that's what I'm hearing out there is that in reality, it's the teachers who are, you know, older, uh, retired earlier than the, than the newer, uh, the, than the more newly retired teachers. Well, this issue was important enough to call a special session on. So I definitely believe that it should be important enough to take up um, as an emergency item. We are losing teachers in droves because they don't see a future in this career. They don't think that they can retire after a certain amount of years served and live a fulfilling you know, retirement. So we have to do something to make sure that this um, profession, this honorable profession, is seen with respect and dignity, not just now, but in retirement as well. So, I mean, like I said, this was an important enough issue to call a special session on. Um, Republicans and Democrats worked on passing a 13th check for our retired teachers. It's now time to make that um, permanent. Okay, we're pressed for time here, so I hope we can just move on to the, the final question. Thank you very much, sir, for your, uh, your question. We'll go to the last question here. All right, uh, thank you all for your service. And uh, I have a property tax relief question. And because of our percent-based homestead exemptions, the, if we every billion dollars given in property tax relief, the vast majority will go to wealthy homeowners. Um, and so I wonder if any of you would support the idea of allowing absolute property tax exemptions. There's a bill already filed on that. Or what about like a one time everybody has 500 bucks off? Uh, and that kind of thing would actually benefit low income people, whereas across the board really won't. Well, I support equity, and uh, I'm not sure I know the math at this point, but I definitely believe that uh, taxes should be fair and equitable, and so that and if, if it addresses issues of fairness and folks, as, especially in the state where we have a regressive sales tax and gas tax that impact lower income folks more than it, it does uh, higher in income folks, so I, I, I definitely am for equity, so I would look at any way that we can achieve that as an option. That time for maybe one more answer on that? I, I just don't live my world jealous of anyone or thinking that anyone has it better. I just kind of worry about myself. And, you know, if one guy paid more into it, does he get a more percentage back? Maybe. I'm not sure yet. We'd have to look at the math on it. But, um, you know, just because somebody paid much more into the system, should they get that a little bit more back? Probably. Okay, well, thank you very much for that question. We are just about out of time. Thank you for joining us here today in person and virtually as well. Thank you to our panelists, of course, and thank you to the Texas Tribune members who tuned in today. Once again, a reminder that the support of our members keeps events like this free and accessible for all. If you value our events, donate and join us as a member at texastribune.org slash donate. Thank you, everyone. Really appreciate your time this morning. Thanks,